Before we get started with today's podcast, we'd like to ask returning listeners to leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you really enjoy it, share a link to this podcast with friends or family who would enjoy hearing our weekly discussions about basketball and basketball culture. Now, on to the show. Yeah, isn't it amazing when Michigan can keep this game to a 19.9 inch game inside that three point line, it's all there. Welcome to the 19.9 podcast. We're doing something a little different today. We have been off the last couple of weeks, but that doesn't mean that 19.9's been off. They've had some awesome releases for the start of summer. And we want to go back and revisit some of the interviews that we've had over the past couple of months. It's been our highest listenership, and I think that there are some stories that could pull out that you can re-listen to and enjoy over this coming holiday weekend and even share with friends. So I want to kick things off here with AJ Moye, who was kind enough to come on, tell a, a story about the 2000. Uh, two team that I could listen to over and over, just one of my fondest memories as a basketball fan. So we're going to get started with listening to his story uh, there, and I'll jump back in in between just to kind of introduce things and keep things moving along. But I hope that you guys enjoy this, and here we go with AJ. Speaking of that, let's talk a little Indiana 2002 because I think, you know, cementing your legacy in the history of IU uh, hoops, uh, just that tournament run, what were your recollections of winning the Big Ten championship and just that that tournament run? Because your passion and just uh, enthusiasm for the game and some uh, pretty amazing gameplay just, you know, coalesced right at the same time for just iconic plays uh, and so much fun. So what do you what do you remember about that time? Well, I got to say this, man. It truly was a team effort. Uh, Coach Davis, man, I'm going to tell you this. Coach Davis, you know, pe- people will say he's nuts, but, again, Coach Davis is inspired. That guy ha- is one of the biggest and best offensive geniuses in the world. So he used to, he used to draw plays left and right all day long. He watched he watch NBA games, man. I remember he get he get kind of enamored you know, or fixated on a certain team or a certain coach. And he studied the Spurs for like three weeks straight one one time, I remember. And he'd, he'd do that, right? So we had that. Uh, coach John Trelor, he was a wizard in terms of uh, – he's almost like Phil Jackson, you know. He, he could get into the minds of every single person on the team and kind of figure out how we think and what makes us tick. Uh, ben McDonald, he was the guy with uh, just a passion for improving. So, you know, Coach Ben, Coach Mac, he talked to us, and then he was working for each one of us that were kind of tailored for us, right? We had Jim Thomas, national champion, you know what I mean, played in Indiana. He knew it all, right? So right. he would always come with the timely, the timely advice in the moments where we needed it, you know? And, and so we had that. Um, as far as the players, man, had perfect, man. We had Dane Fife was the <laughs> toughest nails. Uh, I, I attribute much of my success on the basketball court, um, from not, not from before, but since the time I met Dane Fife, uh, Dane is responsible for me being a hell of a defender. Dane Fife is that. I was lousy on defense until I met <laughs> Dane Fife. Without Dane Fife, it's probably no me, right? So that's how I feel about him. Jared Odom, tough as nails, tough as nails, tough as nails. I say it again, he's tough as nails. <laughs> you know, over there, big big time player. Cover there, big time player, big time player. You know, I'm just a big time player. May Al Hornsby, tireless worker, tireless worker. That's why he's a doctor now. Yeah. He's a tireless worker. And you know, and Jared Jeff. Talent. He was the best communicator I ever played with. Interesting. You knew where everything was going on on the court because Jared Jeffries used to call it out. He'd be huh. in the back of the defense. He, hey, watch this flare there. Ball screen here, Cub. Hey, let's let's do it. Let's flatten that out. Flatten that out. Like he'd just be talking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Jeff Newton, so smart. Jeff Newton is so smart, and he was Jeff Newton was too ahead of his time. He was like the players now. Yeah. But he had all of that back then. 
So he was like years ahead of his time. George Leach, seven feet, get it out, right? Just get it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and and, and we and Donald Perry. Donald Perry was a world class player. Yeah. Again, he was a he was a player like I don't think people really realize the amount of talent we had on our team. Yeah. Like they they look at like oh yeah the, you know sometimes they say oh yeah they're a bunch of you know hey guys they got three four brothers you know but <laughs> man we had a if you look at it our team was probably like seven Mister Basketballs right? yeah and probably five All American so we wasn't like we were bums and so once we figured it out all of us figured it out. Our practices, I'm telling you, you talk with anybody on that team, our practices were legendary. Hmm. Just were way more competitive than the games. Uh, I think Jared, Jared, they fought that fight that year in practice. <laughs> Jared fought him. I fought him. <laughs> Jeff Newton fought him. George Leach <laughs> fought him. <laughs> I think Coverdale fought him. You know what I mean? And then, and then there were there were there were fights. I think that year there might have been. 16 to 18 fights in practice. <laughs> so you got to understand. So you got a team. If you have a team of men who are fighting each other mm-hmm. in practice, well, what do you think we're going to do in the game? We're going to kill somebody. In the- so, so it, that, that, that team there was the most fun I've ever had. And, and like, listen, I've been on a high school team that was 33 and 0. Mm. We won our state, but I'd say my high school team, that that year with my high school team and that year with that 2002 team, those are the most fun I ever had. And that 2002 team that was hard because we we beat a lot of teams with a lot of talent. Like that Duke team we beat, man, that's ridiculous. Man, man that was six NBA players, ridiculous. So it just it just comes down to yeah, it just comes down to it was a team effort and everyone cared, man. Everyone cared. Everyone contributed. Well, talking about the Duke game, <laughs> I I remember as an Indiana fan and living in Indiana, we always had parties for your for your games, and there's definitely a couple holes in our drop ceiling <laughs> in my parents' house. From uh, they only had a six foot tall drop ceiling, so you know when you got you couldn't jump high, but high enough. <laughs> now, there was a couple holes from especially from your block. I think we all went nuts. <laughs> so tell us what you remember about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I kind of saw the play developing. So we were we were scrambling on defense. We don't like the switch, but we had to switch. So Fife switched on the boozer. So I saw calling for the ball. I said, you know what? When he gets this ball, I know he's going to step baseline. And he's going to try to go up on Fife. I'm going to fly over, and I'm going to knock the hell out of him. That was, that was, that was what was <laughs> You know, I'm just going to foul the crap out of him. And then he'll get his two free throws. Yeah. And then, so when I ran over, as I ran over, I jumped up in the air so high because I'm like, yo, he's going to try to dunk this. I got to get up high enough so he doesn't dunk on me and I can throw this big joker down, (laughs) right? And then (laughs) as I jumped, I just kept going. (laughs) I kept going. And and the thing was, it was was almost like I was 10 to 12 inches higher than him. Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm just going to block it. (laughs) And then. I didn't. I didn't go like it, like it out of his hands. I just went up and put my hand on top. Just kind of set him down with the ball in his hands, and then that's, I lost it after that. I was like, "Man, that's pretty cool." <laughs> <laughs> I still think that that was my coolest thing I've done basketball. What comes across there is just AJ's enthusiasm, and throughout the interview. What was exciting about his approach to basketball is that boundless energy where he would start in the morning coaching people and his day coaching kids and just the knowledge bank that he's developed. Really hope that he stays connected with the Indiana squad. It seems like he is. And if not, he's going to make a big impact on the game of basketball just with the way that uh, he searches out the right type of competitors and the way that he wants to develop them to enjoy the game and to enjoy life, but to also reach and maximize their potential. Uh, The next interview is from our series. Usually we call it Tales from the Bench, but we've got Tom Kleinschmidt, who the Chucker interviewed, uh, and he was definitely not a bench player, but a story from the starters. And he talks about time, his time with Chicago basketball and that era when it was absolutely incredible. The number of players and the diversity of talent that came out of there and he hits on a specific story about hoop hoop dreams, which is uh, near and dear to my heart. I loved 
uh, that program. And I think that uh, just listening to him talk about the talent in Chicago is uh, is a really fun experience. So let's let's hit it with uh, Tom Kleinschmidt. I'm curious about to dig into that a little bit further. Who was kind of maybe the first guy you played against when you were, you know, a little younger and you said like, Oh crap, man. Like this is what it's like. Like this is what big time talent is like. Like who opened your eyes? Uh, Playing against it's tough, you know, cause we're always playing against older guys. So you kind of got beat up and stuff like that. But I remember watching William Gates in the super section. I was a freshman. It was at and let's Hill talk Hill. William Gates of Hoop Dreams is where he's kind of yeah. most kind of known by. Yeah. So, so Willie Willie was a freshman starting on that great Joe's team, and they played uh, Eric Anderson of DeSales at Hinsdale Central for the Super. And I was a freshman. And Eric Anderson went to IU, had a great career there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was McDowell's All-American, played with the Knicks, rest in peace. And I remember watching that Super, and I remember, man, this kid's a freshman, and he had like 28. And I remember saying to myself, well, man, I – I think I'm pretty good, but I don't know. This kid's he's a beast, man. I don't know if I can handle him. And then and obviously watching Eric Anderson play uh in our league, uh didn't play varsity as a freshman. But I remember looking down from the from the balcony and watching him play and say, That's another level. Six nine, shooting threes. I was I was like, wow. So those two guys really impressed me uh as freshmen. And then as I grew up and started playing sophomore junior year. It's kind of levels of play. You know, the, the the pro guys really do a remarkable job with Chicago young guys. And I mean, Randy Brown, Tim Hardaway, J.J. Anderson, these legends in Chicago really take their time to help the top tier high school players or college players develop. And that's what they really did to, for me. I mean, Kenny Redfield from Weber, these, all these guys that had great college and pro careers, whether it be in the NBA or overseas, we all owe them a lot of credit. First of all, they allowed us to play with them, which is the big thing. I mean, these guys are huge stars. And I remember playing at LeClaire Court on 44th and Cicero uh, with Randy Brown, Tim Hardaway, and these guys. I remember going to Fernwood, Garfield Park on the west side. And they would terrorize us, just beat, beat the hell out of us. Uh, but it got us better quicker. It really sped our development up. And then we kind of did it for the younger guys below us four or five years. And it, and so it continues. And uh, I think that's a great thing about Chicago basketball is the older guys really do tend to help the young guys and help them develop and kind of set them straight early. So oh, oh, a lot of credit to those old heads that helped us play ball. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you talk about William Gates, as I said, of Hoop Dreams fame. And, you know, I, I've heard people tell stories about William that like when he was a freshman and sophomore up until that injury, that dude was on the fast track. I mean, he yeah. was legit. Um, yeah, he was, and he was a six, uh, yeah, yeah. Six foot guard. He's from Cabrini Green. Remember getting a friendly one him and playing with him. He had a terrible knee injury. Still still had a really nice high school and cars mm-hmm. career at, at Marquette. Just that, that yeah. knee did bother him. Did bother him. Yeah. And so let's kind of extend that further because we've talked about kind of this broadening of your basketball life, right? From the neighborhood to now Chicago, to the North side, then all of Chicago. And then, you know, it's it's getting bigger and bigger as you start playing in the Catholic league. And so you're seeing more South side guys and guys from the suburbs. And, and then you kind of start to go to kind of the national scene and you start getting some of the camps in the Midwest and maybe some national camps. And that class to 91, there's some real standouts there. You got Glenn Robinson, Jalen Rose, Corey Alexander, Chris Weber, Travis Best. These are a lot of names that are known to you know basketball fans. As you as that world started to extend further, and you got out of Illinois and out of the Chicago area, who really jumped out to you again and meant like, especially those guys who were your peers, who jumped out and was like, like that dude's a hooper, man. That guy's a baller. Well, obviously, you know, a lot of the guys you named, everybody that you named. I mean, we had a AAU team. Uh, that it, it will rival any team right now. It was Jawan Howard, Glenn Robinson, Michael Finley, myself, uh, Sherelle Ford, Donnie Boyce, and that was one AAU team. Now I would spread out with all these teams, but we would travel uh, and play in Indiana uh, and, and uh, or Ohio, and we kind of stayed in the Midwest. But the first t- taste I got was Nike camp at Princeton, New Jersey, at Princeton. When I saw Chris Weber – really play in a structured system against the top 20 or 30 players in the country and how dominant he was. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, Grant Hill was another guy that just, he was a year or two ahead of me, but when those guys were specimens, man, and they were pro players 
when I was coming up at that Nike camp. Jason Kidd was unbelievable. Uh, but guys in my my uh, class, which I think 91, we had 10 kids in the top 100 in Illinois. So we, we had a great class in the state. But Glenn, Chris, Juwan, Jalen, uh, Jimmy, all those guys were great. But, you know, Michael Finley wasn't that, you know, he was like ranking the 70s. Damon Stoudemire was in like the 80s. These guys that had unbelievable college and pro careers that you as a player, like, You'd look at the ranking like, man, that guy's 85. Like, he's way better. He's like top 20 player. Howard Nathan, rest in peace, was an unbelievable player. He was ranked pretty highly, but, you know, he didn't get as much love because he was down in Peoria. He was McDonald's All-American, but, you know, just total unbelievable great player. So, uh, but to answer your question, guys like Finley uh, and Damon Stoudemire really jumped off the mat at you when uh maybe the scouts so-called scouts didn't really see it at, at the time yeah it's interesting you know we being two chicago guys here we talk about michael finley and you know people you know outside of chicago they don't know maybe that finley was arguably the third best guy in his high school team i sure, mean sherelle yeah, ford was the first round draft pick of the yep. supersonics this is the same high school team donnie boyce goes yep. to colorado is the yep. big is the big eight freshman of the year yep. um yep. and he's an nba draft pick Finley yeah. was probably the at the same high school, the third yeah. best of those three, and he ends, you know, obviously ends up having a great career and a lot of success. And it just the the, the depth of talent in Chicago in your era was pretty yeah. sick, <laughs> no yeah, question. Was, you know, even downstate, you know, they had Danny Cross and those guys, Howard Nathan. I mean, it, there was ten guys in the top hundred. So ten percent of the top hundred was from Chicago, or Illinois. It was unbelievable class. I love hearing about Chicago. In that way, 10% of the, the top 100 from Chicago. Uh, it was just a different era for Chicago hoops. But what I took out of listening to Tom talk was the community aspect of it, how the older guys brought up the younger guys. You know, when I see special pockets of basketball over the eras, it seems like that is something that is really a, a huge part of it that – there is somebody that orchestrates things that that creates that culture, and then the players take over and you know form a community with one another so that they perpetuate the the talent and the work ethic and you know you talk they talk about heat culture right now well, heat culture is really just a bunch of individual decisions, but it starts with kind of a, a grain of an idea, and then everyone works hard together to keep that going. Uh, it, it's hard to it's it's hard to do. Maybe the hardest thing to create that that culture, and it's something that can be fleeting too. You know, Chicago has uh, doesn't stand out as much, and maybe that's because the prep schools or or you know other places magneting those kids out of the, out of the city. Same with New York, uh, but it doesn't mean it can't come back. And there might be a coach out there right now that's working to do that. I've got a Charlie Miller story here. Charlie was so much fun to talk to. I ended up talking to him on Easter morning. Uh, he was kind enough to to talk to me about basketball on that day. and was just such a, a blast. He has such an enthusiasm for it. Uh, loved just his perspective on how to transmit ideas to, to young people, not, not just translate for them, but to, to get it like an earworm really into their, into their brains. Um, but, uh, let's, let's listen to a little bit of Charlie here, uh, talking, uh, some, some Bob Knight's stories. Okay. Appreciate it. Let's, let's talk a little bit about coaching. Let's start with coach Knight. What's uh what's a favorite story that, or takeaway from coach Knight uh, that you still, okay. that you still use today. Okay. So um, one famous takeaway, I would say um, I got several. I'm trying to see where I want to go here. That's it, Cause they're all good. They're all good stuff. All good stuff. Um, he would say, I have forgotten more basketball than you guys would ever know. <laughs> yes. That's so great. No doubt. Right? Yeah. He, he would say, that, right. Yeah. Yeah. He would say, um, Another one, because because there's one I want to give you that that pretty much is why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, what's another one? Uh, oh yeah, interesting. He would uh, give me a high school in Jasper. It's it's just Jasper Jasper High School. Yep. There's only one. That's it. Okay, give me give me the give me the right give me a rivalry. Uh, we got Du Bois, the Jeeps. Okay, okay, check it out. Du Du Bois, right? So 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 say you were in practice there, and you made a mistake. You you get ready for Du Bois. Okay. He might say something like, uh, 
Aaron, you know what? You boys going to kick your... Be like, <laughs> first of all, he's referencing a high school in your area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. As you're getting ready for like Michigan State. Right. This this ain't, you know, he'll say, this ain't Killian, Charlie. You know, like Killian yeah. was a high school rival. This ain't, I'm like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where'd you come? With? What? That's pretty impressive, man. I like that. Right? You know, uh, but the 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 biggest one that planted a seed, man. I was working this basketball camp, and uh, I don't know why he said this to me. He said, if you ever want to learn how to do something, Charlie, you got to learn how to teach it. Mm. And he just walked off. I was like, okay. Yeah. And I was like, man, I promise you, 11 years in as a player development, that is why I'm doing what I'm doing. That's awesome, man. You have to learn how to teach. He said that to me walking off. Whatever you want to do, if you want to do it well, you got to learn how to teach. That's a that's a and, mic drop moment. It is. Bro, I'm telling you, when he said that to me, I didn't make sense at 20 <laughs> anymore. It didn't yeah. make sense until I was like about 30 something, hmm. to be real with you. Love the the mic drop moment aspect of that. You You got to know how to teach it. Uh, just a, a great thing to, to say to, uh, I think that there are all the aspects of a great teaching moment in there too. He's knowing something, he has a relationship with the player, he knows something that they didn't even know that he knew about them, brings that in as the hook to what he has to tell them and to communicate to them. There's just a lot of insight and just a lot of Uh, institutional knowledge that he had at that point to be able to communicate in that way and to connect with his players on a deeper level. Speaking of a teaching moment, the next story is actually a teaching moment that I had uh, related to uh, listening and and reading the book uh, from author Pete Croato, who wrote a a book about the NBA. And this is a specific story about Marvin Gaye and the national anthem uh, that I got to uh, use in a a choir class. The students had never heard the song. And uh, you'll hear a little bit about how that how that went here. So let's take a listen uh, to this from Pete Croato's interview. Got another kind of a, a side, sidebar story here, but it'll circle back to uh, the mm-hmm. Marvin the Marvin Gaye song. So I, I read this okay. uh, part in the book about Marvin Gaye singing the national anthem at mm-hmm. uh, at the All Star game, and uh, I have to substitute in the choir class at uh, the middle school here. And we're running out of, we're out we're out of time. And I'm like, what am I going to do? And I had just listened to this chapter. I'm like, you know what? I bet none of these kids have heard <laughs> this version of of the song. And so we, we pop on YouTube and we all listen to Marvin Gaye sing that, and it was such a great great little moment after listening to that chapter because it's fascinating uh just how how kind of again you you wrap that story around how the nba is changing with the culture Mm -hmm. and it does it still seems uh you know very fresh the way he's the way he sings it not as radical as i'm sure it seemed at the time but i'm curious like where you know what that that story meant to you or how you even decided to to include that that in the book well, that came – well, the sto- the the Marvin Gaye story, um, or, or rather, yeah, the, the Marvin Gaye anthem to mm-hmm. me is is the pivot point in the book because that to me is the, is the line between the old NBA and the new NBA. And the story the, – that chapter is actually based a lot on an article that I wrote for Grantland back uh, in 2013. Um, moment of silence that, there. <laughs> uh, pardon me? Moment of silence for Grantland. Yeah, I, I, I love that site. Yeah. Um, my, that was my yeah. That was my first big story, and you know that the Marvin Gaye piece was you know wrote for Grantland, and and after I wrote that story, I thought okay, well there's there's a lot there's a there's a lot here I I couldn't put in. There's a lot here that there's also a lot that signifies the the change of the NBA, All, not only from what I've seen, but also from the two dozen people I talked to who actually said like yeah, this is a pivotal point. So that story was really the really marked the beginning of me thinking of a book thinking of okay well this there's a book here um so yeah that's so that so that story um or rather that anthem i should say mm. is important on a couple levels because a i think it's a marvelous anthem i was i was honored to be able to write about it and to be able to kind of just tell the 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 how to um or the the origin story um or one of the people to tell the origin story i should mm. say um but to me that 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 writing that chapter and then talking to all these people who were there 
made me think, you know what, like there's this, this anthem was more than just a great anthem. It really marked the changing, the changing of the NBA. It marked the, it marked a, a tipping point for the NBA to become a league that, that, that valued entertainment and a good time. And to, and that wasn't going to shy away from being a quote unquote black uh, league. It was, it was not going to like hide from it. It was going to embrace what was on the floor. And to me, Marvin Gaye's national anthem um, at, at that all-star game is a pivotal, um, uh, is a pivotal moment for the, for the, for the history of the NBA. Um and I also think it's a damn good anthem. But I'm curious, what do the kids think of it? <laughs> they they liked it, actually. It's, it's yeah. so fun. You watch people. I mean, Marvin Gaye is undeniably like, I, I mean, I told him, I think he's got, I don't know if he, he's not my favorite singer ever, but right. you could argue that he's got the best voice ever. Like he just, yeah. it's just, un, it's just undeniable to anyone. And, you know, it's choir class, so they're, they're enjoying it. But it's fun because, the, of course, the anthem is a bit in the, the news for controversy. And, sure. and to, to tell them, like, look, this was controversial controversial at, at, that, at right. that time. So, you know, there, there's always a, a way to use, uh, you know, moments to, to politicize things. And, and ultimately what you're trying to do is express yourself and try mm-hmm. to move the, try to move the conversation in a, in a positive direction if possible. And I mean, I think, I think that's what he does. He comes out there with swagger and his sunglasses on, you know, able to be who he is and just opening up, uh, you know, I, some of the people are going to, re- you know, reject it, but a lot of people obviously embraced it and it, and it moves the conversation and, and culture in a, in a positive direction, I think. Absolutely. I mean, I think what's important about that anthem is that, and, and, and Marcus Johnson um, told me this and, 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 and I, and I haven't forgotten it. Like that anthem represented what was on the court. It mm, represented the yes. black NBA. Yeah. And, you know, for years the NBA had trotted out like, you know, kind of. <laughs> I think you said hat. Pat, Bo- Pat Boone before. <laughs> It was Andy Williams, actually, Andy Williams. the All-Star okay, game. Okay. Uh, Robert Merrill. Yes, you know, yes. and again, they, these are all, fine. you know, again, these are, yeah, yeah they're great singers yep. and they're, and they're, you know, they're, they're nationally, internationally known singers and, but, the, but they, but they didn't represent what was on the court, not only just in terms of the, the, the racial dynamics, but also the style. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm certainly no um, musicologist, but when I think of Andy Moon River Williams, <laughs> I, I don't think of a Magic Johnson fast break. No. I don't think of I don't think of the, the NBA. I, but to me, what Marvin Gaye brought brought to that anthem, that to me is just is the NBA. It's 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 soulful. It's beautiful. It's poetic. It's passionate. And again, it it's it's it has all these musical elements that represent black culture mm. and it just it worked it was the right song for the right moment and you're right people got upset about it but those it's funny if you if you look back at the um the sports columnists you yeah. know kind of venting uh, uh about that <laughs> it really it looks so foolish Ugh. i mean it, it it's so it, it those comments have not aged well <laughs> um but that anthem is is iconic it's yeah. going to be around for another it's going to be around forever it's got it's got middle schoolers still bobbing their heads so that's that's a positive <laughs> that's i'll, I'll, t- I'll take yeah, it know. as a, i'll take that as a win Thank you for listening to the 199 podcast. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, make sure you do. And while you're at it, leave us a rating or review. Five stars only, like the basketball camp. We also have links to all of 199 social media so you never miss a release. Until next time, 